Hey, it's Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart, joined by His Excellency uh, Bishop Tim Mansfield. Hello, Bishop Tim. How's it going? <laughs> John, I'm good. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Ten years a bishop and your excellency still makes me giggle, but anyway, go on. <laughs> so, we are doing sort of an unstructured, semi-experimental show that we've been doing uh, these panels lately that I've been really liking. So, I, I kind of want to balance off the show a, a little bit, so it's not just a straight interview show. So, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, the talk gnosis heads, uh, the, I, the, the Gnostic Elite, uh, the, our six fans, uh, may have noticed that we were dwelling on on, on some sort of, on and some certain things and sort of developing out some some different styles. You know, one of those is is a focus on practice, right? That's what I was really into a couple of years ago, talking about how this stuff can be very practical. And then with the panel shows, you know, not just doing straight interviews, having some unstructured conversation. Don't worry, I want to do all three. You know, focus on practice, focus on interviews, and also focus on unstructured interviews where we just share our personal gnosis and discover things through conversation because it is through dialogue, it is through bouncing off ideas from each other that gnosis is developed, that gnosis is flamed, that we discover things. Um, and uh, I'm hoping this process will happen, you know, right now. -ish. But before we get to it, uh, yeah, we have the, uh, we have the commercial. Uh, we can't do the show without you. Patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. Um, you can actually set a limit, so if you just want to give us a buck, go for it. I think that's the lowest you can do as a dollar American. That would be a big help. We have something like almost 9,000 subscribers on YouTube. We get about two or 3,000 um, listeners per show, and we have about 30 patrons. So the, the math, I am guilting you. This is, you know, I'm not wearing my collar right now. Um, but if you want some um, no, independent, <laughs> okay, independent <laughs> sacramental movement in the Catholic guilt, uh, because uh, like uh, like the show won't end, but I'll stop doing it, and so you know I'm sure somebody else will take over. But I hope you like me. But uh, it's it just you know we do need your financial support to actually do the show. Now that said, if you don't have any money, we completely understand. For instance, I don't have any money. So tell people about the show, share it on your social media, send it to somebody that you like. Uh, really, actually, just that that person to person, that's really powerful. Still really works. Uh, but, you know, putting it on your social media. Take your favorite episode, which will definitely be this one, and say everybody has to watch this to get enlightened. Uh, also, you can do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. Okay, the commercial is over. It's over now. Okay, we are talking about the Apothecon of John, Secret John, as I prefer to call it, because I actually really you hate when people... Side. Yeah. Oh, well, there's actually a disservice. I can get right into talking about the book, because some of the translations, particularly when talking about the Aeons, uh, use the Coptic and Greek terms, and it's you miss a lot, right? Uh, you miss so much, because they really need to be in English so that you can see what's going on, understand what's going on. But talking about what's, understanding what's going on, like, one of the reasons I wanted to do this show is I've probably read this book already dozens of times, right? Like, how many times have you read it now in your life? Like, I actually don't. It'd be, it'd be more than a dozen, definitely. It'd be more than I, a dozen, for sure. I've done, it, I've done it on my own a bunch of times, and then I've done it with groups probably six, eight times, something like that, kind of working yeah. through it, you know, week by week, kind of doing a deep read of the text and trying to make sense of it. Yeah. 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 And, and trying to make sense of it, uh, because the more I read it, the more confused I get. So, because it is, it's very easy, and I feel like it almost wants you to do this, because it is, you can't point to it like you can with some other texts, even though we had the longer and shorter versions, it obviously went through some redactions, you know, there are a few different editors in there, but that said, there's so much in there, there's so much intertextuality, um, there's so many callbacks and themes to earlier on in the book that, that is very deliberately constructed. Right, right, um, and and like many other Gnostic texts, particularly the the Gospel of John, uh, see the the show on the lectern, uh, uh, or sorry, the Gospel of John about the Gospel of Thomas, which is you are supposed to to draw out 
the puzzles, right? It is supposed right. to infuriate you a little bit. Uh, it is supposed to not answer all of your questions, so you'll dwell upon them. And, and you know, it's, it's only recently that, that I've really come to see that and appreciate about uh, that about the text, but it's also driving me crazy. <laughs> well, fair enough. So let, let's... I'm gonna I'm gonna butt in for a sec because we're doing a conversational show, right? So yeah, this is yeah, uh, I'm not yeah. I I wanted I want to say, John, that um you know some of the shows that you've done that I've loved the most are the are the you with one guest shows where you're really into the other person's work and it it gets very kind of you know kind of you get very curious about each other and it gets very intertwined. So I'm really delighted to um to be on for a you and one other person show um about a, a topic of mutual interest. Let let's pull back a little bit about because perhaps not everyone that's you know. The you know the deep gnostic nerds will will know this book well, but perhaps not everyone does who's blowing into the show for the first time. So, just as a as a bit of background, so um, the the uh, apocryphon Johannes, um, uh, I think, as it's called in Greek, uh, the secret. So apocryphon gets translated as secret book or secret revelation or secret teaching. You know, you could you could translate it any of those ways of John, and the John that's referred to there is the disciple John, the purported author of the fourth gospel. It's it's usually referred to as the Gospel of John. Um, the book is exists in four redactions. It's it's one of the well two redactions in four copies. Really, it's one of the only Gnostic texts. I think it's the only Gnostic text that we have that many copies of. I think we have more copies of Secret John than we have of the Gospel of Thomas, and we have quite a few of the Gospel of Thomas. Yeah. Um, I think all of those, ver uh, no, one of those versions is from the Berlin Codex, and the other three versions um, are from the Nishamati Library, which, again, the Gnostic nerds will know, is the, <laughs> the Nishamati Library is the collection of, of, uh, of texts that were found in a jar in 1945 um, in, near Nishamati in Egypt, hence the name. Um, and progressively were translated over the next couple of, you know, floated through the antiquities market, lots of hilarious boys own adventure tales and, and wound up eventually getting translated by the seventies. And that's really led to the Gnostic revival of the late 20th century, really the sort of second Gnostic, third, fifth, 12th Gnostic revival of the late 20th century. Um, so it's an interesting, so it's interesting to have four copies of a text and the copy exists in two redactions, a shorter version and a longer version. They're, they're largely similar, kind of, except for a, a middle bit. The longer version has this kind of long insertion in the middle of it um, that adds material from perhaps the Zoroastrian text. That's what it says itself. I guess we guess. So that's interesting because we get two versions. But the, the wording in each of the four versions is slightly different in various ways. And that's super interesting because it gives us a gives us a comparative version of it to kind of look and try to see what the author was trying to say. Some of that scribal interpretation, some of its redaction, some of its, you know, there's various processes going on in the text. The other thing that's interesting about it is, or there's a couple of other things that are interesting about it. Um, one is that the text in the Najamadi, so in the Najamadi texts, um, it's a collection of texts, but those, those texts are bound into a set of, I think, 11 codices. So they're, they're books of papyri kind of bound together to make a little booklet, kind of hand sewn into a little booklet. And the three versions of Secret John that appear in that collection always appear as the first text in a codex. Yes. Which you could infer means that whoever copied out the text in that codex and someone hand, remember, scribes, they hand copied all the text in this codex, decided... Okay, well, before we get to anything else, you should read this. <laughs> yeah. So so we might infer, and you can't prove this, but we might infer that at least for the scribes or for the compiler of those codices, they felt this was a significant text. And the mere fact that it got copied that many times makes it a significant text. Yeah. So that's interesting. And then the it's found near St. Pacomius Monastery, the, the place where it uh, showed up. So... There are some suggestions that maybe the books were in the library at St. Pacomius, Coptic Orthodox Monastery in the desert. Um, maybe they were kind of squirreled away in a jar during a period where it was kind of inappropriate to have potentially heretical texts in the library. That's very debatable and we don't really know, but it's an intriguing kind of hypothesis. Um, if you look at a map of Egypt, 
like Nasha Mahdi is like way down the Nile. Um, it's a fair, it's a fair ways down the Nile in the desert. Um, but the, the text is written in Coptic um, with Greek loan words in it. So it implies that, well, it implies that it was written by Greek speaking Egyptians, right? Um, and that strongly implies that the source of the text was a community in Alexandria. Um, Probably originally in Greek, translated into Coptic, is what most scholars think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very likely. Or, or perhaps, yes, who knows? And who knows? Yeah, who knows? We know nothing. Like, we've got, we, don't, we don't know. We've got nothing about the other origins of it, just like we have basically nothing with most of the Nashamati works. Yeah. So, I think that's all the background that's probably useful that was in the back of my head so yeah yeah no that, that's just it is uh, a lot of people a lot of scholars uh think that that it was it was viewed as an important text because the heresiologists seem to mention it uh yeah. it seems to be early yeah uh, it's often sort of upheld as as the paradigm of the gnostic myth because it's it's longer it's elaborate everything's there it's very detailed some of the other versions of gnostic myths seem to be versions of this Right. Uh, right, even though it's it's not quote unquote the original, right? And we have sort of Gnostic -y stuff and records of Gnostic -y myths before it, but this seems to be very influential, like an early build out of the Gnostic myth that is codified right. and influential on lots of other things. Um, and, and you know, just as you pointed out, with the internal evidence, right? It's the only one that we have four copies of. It's the only one. Like we do have some more Thomas, but uh, we only have fragments. Um, and it's the uh, uh, it's at the, the, the top of the codexes, like, like like what you said. So it's um, uh, it, it seems to have been a, a very important text, uh, and it continues to be a very important text, right? It's it's in many ways what people think of as the Gnostic myth, even if they're getting that second or third hand, they're getting it from Philip K. Dick, they're getting getting it through movies, they're getting it through reading about Gnosticism, you know, it's usually a version of uh, Secret John that, that is sort of, you know, upheld as, as the Gnostic myth. So many other things draw on it, it's true. I, I guess the other, the other things to, I, I'm, 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 in my brain I'm going through the list of things I always do at an intro class for Secret John, yeah. right? So uh, we should at some point talk about the structure of it because the structure is interesting. Um, yes. We sort of probably break out the the kind of phases of it and the the, um, the you know the the, the pseudo canonical parentheses and the frame narrative and all that stuff. Um, but I think the the other thing to kind of just sort of visit with a little bit is the is the its self designation as a secret teaching, um, and I think this relates to what what we were talking about just as you at the very intro of of the conversation. That it's that it's difficult, right? Like it's a difficult text. So um, the analogy I typically make when I'm talking to people about it is between if you think about teaching at a university, right? Now, if you're at a university, then there are some moments where an, an academic or a researcher may give a talk to the public. There's public seminars that happen at universities all the time. And as a regular member of the public, you can wander into a lecture hall and the lecturer will be giving an introductory talk about, about a certain topic. And it's specifically pitched so that any random person can wander into the room. Have you just realized that your mic was completely occluding your face? Yes. I, I probably should have pointed that out. I thought it was deliberate. I thought you were hiding a dodgy mustache or something. Yeah, um, well, the, the hiding in a cloud, uh, hiding in a cloud, <laughs> hiding in a cloud on a throne. Well, you are, um, the, you are, the, you are the demiurge of prognosis, so I think that's yeah. fair. It's perfectly yeah. reasonable. So, well, it, okay, so, so you get public lectures that are designed for ordinary people to walk in off the street. You don't need to have any technical knowledge or background or anything, right? And, and, it's, and it's popular and accessible. If you... But then there's a different level of teaching that happens if you enroll in an undergraduate course with that exact same person, right? And then that assumes that you've got, you know, particularly if it's like a second year or third year undergraduate course, it assumes you've got background knowledge and they can kind of leap into some technical detail. And that's a certain kind of teaching, right? And then beyond that, there's like graduate seminars um, where you'd be sitting in a group of people and it's assumed that everyone in that room has deeply read all the disciplinary literature related to the topic of the seminar. And so you can shorthand things and you can refer to, you know, Simpson 1986 and everyone knows what you're talking about and you can use technical terms from the 1920s and that all makes sense and that's all fine. If a random member of the public wandered into a graduate seminar, 
what on earth is going on or tried to read a transcript of it, it wouldn't make any sense. So yeah. I, my preferred sort of framing and context for most of the Gnostic literature is, I mean, what most of us are used to reading are the epistles and the gospels, really. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe some portions of the, of the Hebrew Bible, but, um, but the epistles and the gospels are, that's public lectures, right? Like, the Gospels are like almost entirely made out of public lecture material that, that Jesus is said to have given to, to random disciples showing up on a hillside, right? Like it's mind like it's mind blowing. <laughs> like the 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 teaching of the Beatitudes and a lot of the parables is like what what are you talking about? Some of the stuff he says in John is is you've got to read it twelve times to make sense of that. But that's the stuff he was teaching publicly, pretty much. Um But I think the I think a lot of the Gnostic material is is at least undergraduate work and i think secret john is is a graduate seminar so i i think it's secret in the sense that of that it's it's not like you know slit your throat if you reveal this it's you're not gonna you shouldn't read that that's you're not ready you, you read some background read a gospel or two and then we'll then we'll talk you know and and it's presumably meant to have been accompanied by you know, in-person instruction from a teacher and being in a community of other people that, that shares the same hermeneutic around the text and all that kind of thing, I, I would imagine. So that's the sense in which I think it's secret. And that's, I think, why those of us now trying to read it without that community of interpretation around it, without it making any, any real <laughs> adjustments to the possibility that it might be getting read by, you know, random members of the public, um, we find it such a struggle. Yeah. Yeah, that's it exactly. Um, and, and I'm sure that, you know, it, it's thought that the, that the Cephians or whatever community, you know, created the text uh, was, was had an understanding of itself as a separate community, as a distinct, distinct there were, strain of Christianity. There were, there were no Cephians. <laughs> there were no Cephians. The, the, the designation Cephian, like most of these things, there's two ways these designations arise. One is some heresiologist comes up with it because it's a way of grouping things they've heard from someone, yeah. you know, the Barbaloits or the Carpocratians or whatever. It's not clear that any of those were communities exactly. It's like Irenaeus is in France and this stuff's all happening in Syria or, or Alexandria. He, he's never met anybody. He's just getting letters, right? He's got no idea. That's one way these designations occur. The other way these designations occur is in, is in academic discourse in the, in the 20th and 21st centuries, in which case... They're literary genres, right? Like, so what people are saying is all these texts seem to use the same terms. We'll call them Sethian. So it's a like I'm I'm, I'm very full on about this. Sethian is a designation for a corpus of texts. It oughtn't be <laughs> really a designation for a group of people because there's absolutely no external evidence that any such group of people actually existed. Yes. Yeah. There's well, really... evidence that there were Gnostics. Yeah. Uh, very arguable. But um, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, sorry, I, I'm pretty pro on that there was at least a group that called themselves Gnostic, uh, you know, for a few reasons. You know, one of the biggest is that 100 years after Irenaeus, right, we have um, um, uh, the Neoplatonists uh, uh, Neo complaining about the Gnostics. So, you know, why are they why are they grabbing a, a Christian heresiologist uh, term anyways? But uh, no, that, that, is, that is correct. That is correct. As, as uh, the way that, I mean, for Karen King, the folks that wrote Secret John are she's from her point of view they're christian it's just christian they're it's christians. a christian yes. it's a christian book right they don't think of themselves as anything other than christians they're christians it's yeah you know. well yeah i mean just like now right like the, there's not a lot uh in common between um i mean there is a lot in common at the same time but you know between mormons uh gnostics uh catholics liberal catholics uh the pentecostals uh but they all they all call themselves christian Right. So, um, yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes bafflingly, but yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it would have been like that in the, in the first and, and second centuries. So though I do, you know, I, I, I do think that, that the core of the text and I, I know scholarship doesn't agree with me anymore is, is, is pre-Christian because I can't get over how you can just rip off the, uh, the beginning and the end. Uh, and you can take out the John stuff, and you can read it just fine. Uh, and there, there isn't a lot of uh, of Jesus stuff in there, right? There is the anointed, there is the Christ. But, but that said, like what we have is a Christian text that was used by Christians. It doesn't matter because that's right. Yeah, yeah. I think you know. I think 
first temple stuff is the key to making sense of it all but that's for probably either later in the show or another show but we can come to that but yeah yeah well, we probably should come to it since it's the key for making sense of it <laughs> but we can get there. Well, I think you i mean we so we talked about kind of covering a series of questions that are the kind of the key the key conflicts and misunderstandings in in yeah. the book of john so let, let's look at those and then maybe some of the temple stuff will come up in the course of, of discussing that or maybe it kind of lays the groundwork for why it's interesting to take a temple perspective on it. Maybe. Yeah. Let's or, or, or maybe our new mini-series, depending on how late we go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. tell me, John, like, a, like you've read this yourself. Have you, ever, have you ever done a study group with it or studied it with other people? No, I haven't, but I, I, I need to start. So, so one of the reasons why, cause, because again, even, even leading up to this year, I probably read the text at least a dozen times, probably more, right? right. So, so like, uh, I am using it, um, uh, I haven't really talked about this in the show, but I'm going to, uh, I'm doing my master's, uh, pursuing my master's through the Global Center for Advanced Study, GCAS. Uh, Dr. Tim Mansfield wrote me a, a, a very wonderful reference letter. Thank you, Dr. Mansfield. Um, so, so you know, this is, uh, this is, this is a, yeah, this is the, uh, the you know, the, the main Gnostic text that, that I'm, I'm sort of uh, using in, uh, uh, in the thesis that I'm writing, right? Um, there's some other, some other Gnostic texts as well. And, and going through it again, uh, I, I realize that when I'm talking to people about the text, recollecting the text, and sometimes reading the text, I'm reading it through the lens of other Gnostic texts and uh christian mysticism and christian gnostic key uh, occultism from the last 200 years right which is not, not a, yeah <laughs> yeah well we're going to get to that because you're, yeah. you're the first por person to point that out to me and you are absolutely correct i mean that might be you know we can start literally at the beginning with a major misconception about the text so uh, now now in my defense and in defense of all of us this is how we particularly if you're clergy, how everybody reads religious texts, because the four Gospels come from four different Christian communities and have differing theology and have very different ideas about who and what Jesus was. Um, yet we have had a functioning Christian church for the last 2,000 years. Like, they, we make it work. Uh, yeah. Um, so Kind of more or less sort of functioning. I, I, I feel like, um, I mean, one of the... I'm, really grateful for the the little the the small bands of people that have volunteered to for these study groups to kind of go through this text with me because i swear to you like um i had read it a bunch of times myself i'd studied it i'd written course notes on it but the process of going through it with other people other people see things i can't see right so they, they pick out dimensions of it or they notice connections or they see an unusual use of a word and they say what's that about and i'm like wow i didn't notice that at all that's really cool let's dig and let's find out and let's go find a Coptic dictionary and look it up and um because i think i, I think that's the great you, you're dead right about the canonicals right like i like it's extremely difficult to read the text that's in front of you yeah. it's very very hard right like there's the there's the whole sits in laban the the you know the taking into account the living context of the people that wrote the text, that's a whole complicated thing. But, but actually just simply reading the text that's actually in front of you and kind of pulling apart the cobwebs of 2,000 years, you know, of, of magisterial, well, fog, I'd say. And, and depending, on the, depending on the church context you've come through, you know, you're dealing with, with Catholic or Protestant or Orthodox or somebody else's interpretation over the top of the text that's actually in front of you and and it's difficult because some of those interpretations have a deep validity to them and some of those interpretations are political choices that are made to reinforce a certain doctrinal position that was taken up in a historical moment for a historical reason and doesn't necessarily need to be maintained i would probably argue um so it's really hard and it, it takes effort and work and i think it takes company to actually read the text that's in front of you so this is the similar issues with secret john it doesn't have the fog of kind of mainstream theology over the top of it but it does have quite a lot of fog over the top of it um so it's 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 inherent bafflingness is is complicated by the by you know the last century or so of, of added bafflingness probably over the top of it yeah do you yeah. want to do you want to, should we visit with the, the structure of the text a little bit? You've kind of alluded to it just then, but um, 
Oh uh, yeah, please. Oh, and and by the way, when uh, when we're talking about some of these subtleties and uh, some of these things that we've noticed, it's it's not a a we're smarter than you, and this is the right way to read the text, and this is also the right way to do Gnosticism, right? Because as I said, this this is many ways. I, Particularly in the creation story and and some of its some of its subtleties, it's it's not necessarily what's found in some of the other Gnostic myths, right? But you know, at the same time, like uh, I think I said to you, some sometimes I wake up, you know, a world hating dualist. Sometimes I, I I wake up a gentle Christian mystic, right? And and again, you know, uh, people can say, oh, okay, you know, these modern Gnostics, they don't want to commit, they're all wishy washy. But this is this is what most religious people do. We just admit it <laughs> um, because, you know, uh, all, all of these texts, and it's not just Christianity either, right? You know, the uh, the Hebrew Bible, again, there's conflicting images of God in it. Uh, many uh, uh, sanghas in Buddhism actually use a wide variety of texts, uh, particularly Mahayana sanghas and the Tibetan sanghas that come from all sorts of different eras and all sorts of different uh, Buddhist communities, uh, and they slam them together to, to make something that works. And, you know, I'd actually say that this is um, well, I was just saying uh, to reverse w what I was just saying uh, about what not to do and what to do is, uh, at least for me personally, I, I would say that, you know, this is this is what we should be doing, right? Is, is we, we need to be struggling. We need to understand that this is myth and that this is not the only version of the myth and uh, wrestle with it, to, uh, to use a very Judeo-Christian uh, metaphor. Okay. Absolutely. Um, well, to, to, to add on to what you're saying a little bit, I think I like the 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 process of spiritual well healing and awakening, and those two things are entwined. I think, particularly coming from our tradition, the process of spiritual healing and awakening awakening goes through multiple stages and phases for an individual human, and it's exquisitely entwined with your own context, the way. You, your neurological system and and also with your specific upbringing and your cultural background so there's there's not a single approach that's going to work for everyone and there's not a single text that does the work so i think i think the strength of this kind of this more open approach to textuality um and not having a single way to do it the weakness of it is there's, there's not, not like a straightforward path to follow i think but the, the the strength of it is the re, I mean the, the actual reality of this, of of this process of spirituality is that it's yours and and you have to find the guideposts and the waypoints and the paths and the practices that that help you go to the next stage. A community absolutely helps, and spiritual guides can absolutely you know teachers and spiritual guides and and um, and mentors and whatever can help. But ultimately, it's between you and God really and and you've got to figure that stuff out and and the more places you've got to draw on for for guidance and orientation i think the better off you're at sorry this is a digression i guess from what we're actually well, meant to be talking about well no this is I, um, actually actually it's it's one of the central lessons of the book well, I mean, <laughs> and, and, and the reason i find that i, I i've got I was, I was thinking before like i think i think there's an appropriate disposition to all this stuff where i think I think you've got to actually have a deep ambivalence towards all this material, right? Because yeah. it's yes. um, it's simultaneously deeply precious and profound and a very personal thing, this text. And at the same time, it doesn't matter in the slightest and yeah. you should throw it away. Um, it got... <laughs> um, there's a digression there that I'll avoid taking. But um, what matters is... And the reason it's a precious text, I think, is that it does a spectacularly good job, given when it was written, I think, of reflecting to a human being something of the structure of their own psychic and pneumatic system. And it does that by talking about, it phrases itself as a kind of a, the, the scholars call it a cosmological narrative, because it seems to be talking about the, the origin of the world, to, to quote the title of a, of a different book, um, and where it came from and how things came to be the way they are. But, it, but for the ancients, as above, so below, right? So anytime you're talking about the, the nature and structure and creation of the universe, you're also simultaneously talking about the nature and structure and creation of the human being. Um, oh, uh, Bishop, uh, is something brushing, it sounds like something's brushing up against your mic. Well, it's it's one of those mics, and so every time uh... I just quite a lot, it's, um, so I'll just, just try to hold it. I apologize. No, no, it's all good. 
Uh, <laughs> this is because you're getting excited. Yeah. Then it'll, then it'll get sort of tangled in it. I'll just stick it in the beard somehow. Yeah. Um, okay. Structure of the book. So, yes. um, as you've alluded, there's a there's a core text. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, myself towards the camera. There's a core text, and around the core text, there's what's called a frame narrative that acts as a sort of a parenthesis around the core text. So the, the core text makes no real reference to either John or Jesus. Yeah. Um, it's just about this cosmological narrative and, and the, the sort of the creation of the world and the, and the nature of the human being. And the frame narrative places that core text in the, in the context of, um, of a conversation. You know, John is troubled and he's been told off by a Pharisee, I think, and um, and then the savior it doesn't it actually doesn't actually say jesus i don't think yeah it might just say savior which is of course very interesting for those those uh those those pre-christian uh, uh uh theories also it's not a pharisee i i he might be called a pharisee but it, you know he's 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 a Jewish he's he's a he's a a Judean uh, religious authority of some kind whose name, interestingly enough, is Aramanios. Aramanios, right? Aramanios, which which according to does say Pharisee. Yeah, it does say Pharisee. It does say Pharisee. Okay. All three versions that have that passage say, "If only if only someone had brought the critical edition of the Secret John along to this book so that we could." check what we're saying about yeah so the pharisee aramanios um approached him and said to him where's your master who you used to follow i, I like to think that he started with nina and nina and nina before he before he started speaking um yeah. where's your master who you used to follow he's gone to the place from which he came the pharisee said to him with deception did this nazarene deceive you which is a good deception is a good way to deceive people i think yep um and filled your ears with lies and closed your hearts and turned you from the traditions of your fathers um and so john you know flees the temple and goes to a mountainous and desert place and grieves in his heart. And then the savior appears and says, don't worry, I've got a story to tell you. Um, and then pretty much begins, you know, yeah. John, John explains what happened and, um, and the savior offers to communicate to him the truth of the matter, really like the deep, th there's some sense in which this is like a, um, a deeper layer of teaching beyond what, john had already received you know like he's the the pharisee says there's one you know makes a wise crack to him basically and he like his whole his whole mood collapses and he has to run off to the desert because the pharisee was mean you know um and jesus is like it's okay you're all good let, let me let me reveal some things to you that might set your mind to rest and tells him this entire story of the creation of the world and that goes through also that's the opening frame narrative and the closing frame narrative after the rest of it's finished is the um the questions of john you might say i i like calling it that because there's a cathar text called the questions of john um where john asks like okay but specifically though like you know and, and like digs into specific and certain things and kind of asks for more details on them and that's the kind of closing off of the thing so in the middle um there's uh there's an opening portion these aren't titled, but I, I call the opening portion the, the, the hymn of the monad. So it, it um, talks about the nature of the one, uh, and that's usually rendered in English in, in capital, capital O-N-E, um, the undifferentiated wholeness prior to creation. Um, and then we we go to a second phase that talks about the emergence of the aeons, beginning with um, Barbalo the first the first thought of the hidden father and then unfolds through these aeons and the last of the aeons to unfold um, in this process that goes through the four luminaries and the creation of autogenes christ and all that and then at some point down towards the end of that this aeon called sophia appears um, then we move into the second phase where sophia um, decides to create Kind of in a, in a mirror action of what Barbalo does uh, in calling forth the aeons from the luminous water. Um, Sophia then decides to create under her own steam and she creates a thing, turns out to be kind of hideous and she sort of regrets it and she kind of hides it. Um, but then the thing, Yaldabaoth, um, goes on to kind of like, has taken on this kind of like Jones for creating. And so Yaldabaoth kind of like hidden in his secret place then goes on to create a whole bunch of other 
powers and principalities, and I use that term advisedly, under himself. Um, then there's a, so where are we at? Like frame narrative, him of the monad, creation of the aeons, Yaldabaoth and the creation of the this kind of like psychic chaotic realm. And then somewhere in there, the the perfect human, which is probably a version of the autogenies, is kind of revealed from the higher realm to the lower realm. And Yaldabaoth and his archons kind of glimpse it um, in what to them is heaven. Um, and they go, oh, that's that was cool. Let's make one of those. And so they they create this, they create the human, they create Adam, the human. Um, and as a as a mirror image of what they'd seen in the higher realm. Um so you know, it's so evocative. <laughs> it's yeah. Such a beautiful evocative thing. But then and, Adam and, and sorry to just to point out, and of course this, this is a parody of of the earlier creation story. So it's 100%. the yeah. Yes. So everything so there's a there's a parody structure like the steps that the 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 unfolding of the aeons goes through in that in that third section then parodically reoccurs in the realm of the demiurge and so yeah. everything the demiurge does and and the demiurge's archons do uh are kind of like I, I you know it's like if i say keystone cops probably no one always knows what i'm talking about but the kind of like the the jokey parody kind of like ah, kind of like doesn't quite work, a little bit broken, you know, nice try everyone, let's let's do it again later, kind of version of what had ha happened in the higher realm. So just as the as the autogenies is created in the upper realm, so Adam is created in the lower realm. And then and then this weird moment happens where Barbalo, the first, the mother father, the primal mother father, um, sends a kind of reflection of herself into the lower realm directly. So she steps down into the lower realm as a figure called Epinoia. Um, and there's some emissaries that, that come along and the emissaries say, Psst, hey, you know, your, your Adam's not living. Maybe if you breathed into him. Um, and so they sort of trick Yaldabaoth into breathing into Adam. And what he breathes in is the spirit of his mother, Sophia. So the, the divine essence of Sophia, which she would breathed into Yaldabaoth to animate him, Yaldabaoth now breathes into Adam. And the, the text has the Aldabaoth then losing it, but somehow not becoming inanimate. <laughs> There's all kinds of plot holes. <laughs> there were no fandom wikis back then, so no one picked them up, but there's all sorts of plot holes. Um, and then Adam stands up, and uh, there's a whole sort of kind of like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden section. Um... Epinoia hides herself in Eve and then comes out of Eve later to teach Adam and Eve as an eagle in a tree. Um, that's super interesting. And then she kind of conveys to them the, the secrets of their situation. Um, and then they kind of liberate themselves from this kind of fake garden that the Demiurge has created for them um, and become free. And they they have children and Cain and Abel and then they have a third son called Seth and then Seth is the one that carries out the return to the garden and that's why these folks are called Sethians because of the sort of like the, the sort of semi-deification of Seth um, and then I think there's a there's the closing frame narrative and then I does the pronoia him happen before the closing frame narrative or at the end of the closing frame narrative? I, I believe it happens before Right, so it's at the end of the core text. There's a there's a lovely piece of him, who that's the that's a kind of a, a hymn of of the first thought. So Barbalo, uh, as she's called earlier in the text, she's referred to as Pronoia at this at this later part, and it's got all these resonances with the opening of the Gospel of John, and that's much commented on. Um, yeah. And there's the closing from narrative. John asks the Savior a whole a whole bunch of questions about the kind of ticky tacky details of how all this is meant to work, um, and then it finishes with. Hi, I'm John. I'm done. Mic drop. We're good. And that's it. So obviously what there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in there. There's a the, you know, the the lower realm functions as a parody of the upper realm, but it also functions as a parody of the Genesis narrative in the Tanakh. Yes. Um and that's very deliberate. Like it actually says it's not as Moses said, it's like this, right? Yeah. Um 
And that's important to understand very carefully. And I think it's sometimes where a temple interpretation can be helpful in terms of understanding what's actually going on there and why, why that text is there. Um, but yeah, complicated. Yes, very complicated. And even more complicated if, once you dig into it, because there's all sorts of things. You know, I never noticed, uh, that it was something that, that you pointed out as well, is that um, Yalda Bayoff is, is first put in, hidden in a cloud, right? But yeah. then he actually moves somewhere else. He, he doesn't, I obviously, because, because, because again, you, you just slam these things into your brain. So I'm like, okay, he's hidden from the cloud. And then I guess from the cloud, he creates the material realm. But uh, he act, it, it just, the text says something like he goes somewhere else. He leaves the cloud, he goes somewhere else. It, well, where is this somewhere else? How come it, we've never heard about it before? How can exactly. there be something else outside of the aeonic uh, uh, oh, flow? Well, that, that hidden in a cloud behind the throne is, yeah. um, that's a direct slam of uh the glory of the lord and the cherubim throne and the holy of holies in the second temple yeah um, i mean that that one is like pure 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 uh temple talk yeah. not not super obvious you know unless you're kind of aware of that context then you're not it's not super obvious but that's yeah. what's being referred to but that's definitely what's being referred to yeah I, well, um, so, oh what the, is Sorry, and also we're going to be probably talking about some different interpretations of the text, but but I don't actually think they're conflicting, and I think it is deliberate because I, I do really think that it is that complicated of a text. Because um, you know, Karen King and and others, uh, the Jesus Seminar, um, you, uh, really uh, see a, a lot of politics in the text. Uh, right. The politics not not related to the two temples. Um, uh, the, the, you know, a, a parody of the Roman emperor, right? Oh, a, uh, politics is temple politics, John. Yes, that's true. Uh, the solidarity with uh, with the poor and suffering, right? So they see that in the text. I, I think it is there. I think it is partly a, a parody of the Roman emperor. But at the same time, I think it's also a uh, a parody of the Second Temple. And I think it is also a, a guide to whatever enlightenment is. So um, and I don't think that's a read-in. I, I think that the, the, the community or author that put together the version that we have meant for it to work on, on these different levels. Um, because, because of that, because of that principle that we, I was talking about earlier, that I think you know, for us we think of politics as one whole thing, we think of psychology yeah. as a whole different thing, yeah. we think of spirituality as another whole thing. Yeah. These are all separate. We think of like cosmology as part of physics, and it's a completely different thing. Not how the ancients thought. No, the ancients thought heaven has a structure. The gods are organized in a certain way. The way human society is mirrors the way the gods are the way i am in myself mirrors the the way the gods are it's all one interconnected wholeness it's not they're not separate they're all they're distinct and they're not it's not one to one they, they weren't you know silly about it but but they also didn't think of them as completely separate things and completely distinct realms of inquiry um it was all united so yes. that's that's an important adjustment to make in your head i think it's which is another reason why it's hard for moderns to read this stuff and actually see what's that that that's actually there in front of them exactly well yeah i mean i i think the text does talk about three things that we would now call psychology uh religious politics maybe and uh <laughs> secular politics uh, right. because there, there's a lot of psychology in the book like ancient peoples did have conceptions of psychology right it's just not what we necessarily uh, recognize as psychology because with, which we'll talk about like you mentioned pronoia you know that that word means something like afterthought uh epinoia um uh interestingly, epinoia. Uh, interestingly enough is, is is translated by um pagels i think as uh like creative imagination i i think that might be a bit of a creative imaginative stretch on her on her part but it's it's very interesting um so because the uh, uh it, it's really funny because you, you kept saying cortex um all right <laughs> and you're like the cortex but uh <laughs> the, the the creation the initial creation the first creation is is something like like consciousness happening because the first father the unknown father, uh, um, there's this long stretch that, that Jesus is saying to John, the Savior is saying to John, right? Explaining that that the original divinity, the beginning of the universe, I, I don't know, we don't, well, we don't have words for it because he spends a long time talking about how we don't have words for it, right? right so right. The, the ultimate divinity that all this stuff comes from is not a divinity. It actually specifically says it is not a god. <laughs> um, but it's not not a god. It's not a being, but it's not not a being. 
which is very this is this is classic uh this is classic near eastern eratology um business right like um you see it in later work like pseudo dionysius is mystical theology with that uses um systematic paradoxical negation to try to describe the divine nature you see it in thunder perfect mind which uses pa like affirmative paradox to to kind of cultivate the mind into the transcendent nature of of um of thunder uh and you see it here um in the in the monad passage uh there's a just the bit you're talking about um he is the invisible spirit uh, the, the monad is a unity with nothing above it it is he who exists as god and father of the all the invisible one who is above the all who exists as incorruption and as pure light into which no eye can gaze he is the invisible spirit of whom it is not right to think as a god or something similar for he is more than a god since there is nothing above him for no one lords it over him he does not exist in something inferior to him since everything exists in him yeah hmm Everything exists in him is a really pivotal phrase that everyone forgets half a page later. Yep. For reasons. So that, yep. That that, <laughs> would, in, that would include uh, the, our pal Yalda Bayoff, right? That would include everything else. Everything um, else. Yeah. So the, um, uh, the, the Barbello aside, right? The creation kind of starts. Um, so, so this being that is not a being that um, kind of becomes a being by looking into a mirror. Like uh, surrounding the the unknown father, the the invisible spirit. What should I call it? The invisible. I'll stick. I'll stick with invisible spirit. Um, um, well, the, the, so there's an important there's an important transition. Like the, that early passage talks about the one, yes, which is above all things, and right. then it shifts terms and it stops talking about the one and it starts talking about. Uh, hang on, let me just make sure because I, I I interchange Gnostic terms all the time and I shouldn't in this case because it's not. I, I mean, I do too, and that's what we're talking about. <laughs> It so says, I think we're going to be digging out the, these commentaries and the original text quite a bit. I had some open on my computer. It, it could also be the case. Um, the Father, who's later called the Perfect Invisible Spirit, I think. Okay. Um, oh, that, that's the, some people see that as referring to Barbalo. It's not super clear in some passages. but I, I was wondering that myself, because uh, it, it does seem to also... But, but Barbalo is, uh, Barbalo is the, the closest First reflection the of the first father so they're kind of but oh yeah so yeah that that that's very interesting right because of course once you have the the first father there can no longer like there, there's no longer one right exactly so um for we know not the ineffable things we do not understand what is immeasurable except for him who came forth from him namely from the father for it is he who told us told it to us alone for it is he who contemplates himself in his light which surrounds him namely the spring of living water. And it is he who provides all the aeons. And in every direction, he perceives his image by seeing it in the spring of the spirit. It is he who put his desire into his light water, which is in the spring of the pure light water, which surrounds him. And his thought became actual. She came forth, namely she who had appeared before him in the shine of his light. This is the first power, which was before the all and which came forth from his mind. She is the pronoia, the providence, or the, the forethought, or the first thought of the all. Her light shines like his light, the perfect power, who is the image of the invisible virginal spirit, who is perfect. And that's that phrase there is my claim that the father is the perfect invisible spirit, because she is the image of the perfect invisible spirit. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. The, the, first the, power, the first power, the glory of Barbello, the perfect glory in the aeons, the glory of the revelation, she glorified the virginal spirit, and it was she who praised him because of him she had come forth. Yeah. Now, um, the, in the translation I have is, uh, now this father is the one who beholds himself in the light surrounding him. One capitalized. So the father is the one, uh, is generated when the one beholds himself by looking into the, the spring of living, uh, living water. Which, which is um, the primal differentiation within the one, right? Like, so it's the, it's the desire to know and then the thought which arises from the desire to know. The desire penetrates the reflective world. We've been talking about the mirror mind, I think, on and off for the last week, right? Yeah. Um, the mirror the mirror stage and the mirror mind and those various kind of both spiritual and psychological references to that. Yeah. Well, before we, we go any further, and, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming his his grace, uh, um, 
uh, uh, Bishop uh, uh, will be and is watching this. So, of course, you know, I, I really can't go any high. As in, I mean, I, actually, I should say he better be watching this. So, you know, I, I can't go any farther without mentioning a, uh, a certain uh, philosopher, writer, professor from the, uh, uh, the, the area that we now call Serbia and Croatia, whose uh, name starts with Zed. So, of course, I'm talking about Zlatko uh, Plesha. So, uh, Dr. Plesha... <laughs> <laughs> there's, there, there's a joke that a joke for one person so uh the, the, dr plesha points out that that this is is similar to to a lacanian the the the, the psychoanalyst uh, uh lacan's idea and other uh, psychoanalysts and other psychologists idea of something called the mirror stage which is our our ego and our consciousness starts to develop when we, I mean, it's not just literally a mirror, but uh, it can be uh, the, how, how we're reflected in all sorts of things, but we'll just say a mirror for uh, simplicity's sake, when we see ourselves in a mirror as an infant, right? This is the beginning of, of the ego. And uh, uh, Dr. Plesha, this is the beginning of subjectivity, or one of the beginning, this is what helps subjectivity to develop, right? This is what uh, turns us uh, from, from a completely unconscious being into uh, a conscious being. So uh, Dr. Plesha points out, well, that that's what's happening here, right? Because because the one isn't isn't this, it, like it's it like this is what happens when it starts thinking, um, and it, it goes through the mirror stage, right? So that the first father is the the beginning of of an identity of of a uh, of of an ego in the positive sense of a sense of self of right. uh, of of subjectivity of becoming a subject of uh, being a being because it's not a being before it looks into the mirror. Um, and the, uh, um, uh, the, the thinking continues. So, so sorry, uh, 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 um, I, I think we should probably, uh, go to an important point that I never noticed until you pointed it out, if, if we want to get into it. It's, it's, of course, more aeons come after the, uh, the, 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 these big two out of the one, right? The, the, right. the, the, the invisible spirit and, and Farvello. Um, now, many Gnostic cosmologies, have uh, uh, are emanationist, where it's it's something like um, dropping a, a pebble into the water and the waves going out, or uh, a one cell organism uh, dividing itself over and over again, and that that's why what, what I always read into the text, what I what I always assumed the text was saying, but uh, is it? Well, I I think the division of the cells not a bad image, but the, the emanationism is tricky it's not a term that comes from this era it's plotinus which is significantly later um but it's not even plotinus like he doesn't use that term the term emanation is a theosophical term from the late 19th century so that's worth knowing and you know everything theosophy touches goes odd you know it's not ever quite there's a lot to recommend the theosophical society but um Fidelity to the source text is not usually one of them, um, I think. And I, I don't think most people quite grasp precisely how deep and significant the influence of theosophical interpretation has had on the whole of um, esoteric spirituality through the entirety of the 20th century. Because it's like those folks went on and did everything. And a lot of the translators of things were theosophists. And so there's a lot of sort of theosophical interpretational framing that goes on in everything. And this is one of those places. So um, the other big thing that everybody tends to bring to this conversation is Kabbalah, or they think they're bringing Kabbalah. What they're actually bringing is Athanasius Kircher, um Jesuit, Christian, Jesuit. Am I right? Yep. 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 Jesuit Christian uh, Kabbalist. So, you know, so not Jewish Kabbalah exactly. Um, and his particular formulation of the Tree of Life, which is very specific to Kircher, lots of people use it, but that that very familiar kind of thing with the ten sephirot with the paths and all that stuff, that exists in textual form, but as a diagram, that's the, that's the, that's the Kircher tree, right? So that, that Kabbalistic formulation, particularly the idea of the Kircher tree and the the and soft and then Keter and then the and then the the divine light sort of cascading down through these levels of brokenness. That's Kabbalah. That's 13th century um 
Jews in Spain re reflection of earlier Jewish mysticism from a thousand years before reflected through Jesuit thinking and then out into the Theosophical Society and then into the present day and winds up being, you know, a certain thing. So what's inherent in that way of seeing it is that there's the there's the divine and then there's these layers of of departing from the divine right if you closely read that text of the unfolding of the aeons there's no departing going on there's differentiating within the divine mind but there's no departing from the divine there's no sense in which any of the aeons is further away from the father than any of the others yeah and it's, uh Oh, the specificities, sorry. the specificities, and that's why the image of cell division is not terrible. But the idea of like ripples moving away from the source of the drop of the pebble is just plain wrong. It's not there. It's not in that text. It's it's um it's an interpolation, right? The only the only moving away that happens is when Sophia does the takes the axe that Sophia takes. Yes, and uh, uh, too not 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 to belabor a point about how this is meant to be obviously a psychological metaphor as well as lots of other things, right? Uh, about how how humans develop, how humans should develop, how human development can go wrong. <laughs> um, right. uh, but uh, uh, Dr. Plesha really really emphasizes that that all this happens not just because the one starts thinking, but because the one wants to know itself. But what does you know that that long intro uh the, the, with all the negations say the one cannot be known right very subtle very good very clever right the one can't be known so when the one tries to know itself the one can't be known so from the very That's... beginning even when yes. the first father is generated the one can't be known we're only going to end in well look around uh <laughs> Sophia's error is not the first error in the book. No. no. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what? We're already... Uh, uh, um, uh, maybe I'll edit this out. Maybe I won't because it's, it's, just, a, it's just a conversation. We're, we're only at the, the what, the first uh, couple... Ooh, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, not even at the first chapter of the book. Uh, we're already at a, an hour ten, but I'd like to keep going. But my computer is actually dying. So uh, maybe I'll run and get my computer cord. And uh, did you want to take a little break and keep going? Uh, I'm good. Just okay. get your computer cord. Let's let's keep pushing on. Okay, let's I do it.